tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night. What immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry? <laughs> Mr. Blake died at six o'clock in a most glorious manner. He said he was going to that country he had all his life wanted to see. He is to be buried on Friday at 12 in the morning. The year 1827, a friend's letter about the death of William Blake, who was buried in an unmarked grave in the old London cemetery at Bunhill Fields. Blake wrote two poems that practically everyone knows. Jerusalem has been adopted by the Women's Institute, becoming their anthem to the English way of life. But why do so many people react so strongly and so differently to Blake's other poem, which strikes no proud or patriotic chords? It's neither hymn nor nursery rhyme. Why do so many, old and young, know or partly know or think they know or want to know the tiger? What is it that makes the tiger have such a powerful effect? It's sheer magnificence, its strength, latent power, a brute beast, perhaps coupled with its glorious colouring. The lion is just an ordinary drab buff colour, but the tiger is like reflected sunlight, shadows dappling across him, a contrast of white. I think William Blake put it so aptly when he said, tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forest of the night. You can imagine it in the dark green of the forest, burning there. The very thought makes the back of your hair rise. This huge, glorious, golden animal looking at you through the darkness of the forest. There are six verses, 24 lines, in The Tiger, which Blake published as one of his songs of experience in 1794, when he was 27 years old. Like all his poems, he engraved, decorated, and coloured it himself. Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night, what immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry? In what distant deeps or skies burnt the fire of thine eyes? On what wings dare he aspire? What the hand dare seize the fire? And what shoulder and what art could twist the sinews of thy heart? And when thy heart began to beat, what dread hand and what dread feet? What the hammer, what the chain, in what furnace was thy brain? What the anvil, what dread grasp dare its deadly terrors clasp? When the stars threw down their spears and watered heaven with their tears, did he smile his work to see? Did he who made the lamb make thee? Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night, what immortal hand or eye dare frame thy fearful symmetry? When I was a Christian, um, I, I loved Christ very much. Uh, when I was in my teens, and so on. Um, now I love Blake very much. He's as important to me as, as Christ was then. I think he's perhaps the very greatest Englishman that ever lived. The poet, Robert Graves, has lived in Majorca for the last 30 years. In Goodbye to All That, his autobiography of the First World War, he describes how he kept Blake's poems with him in the trenches. Today, Graves takes a strong a fairly common line on the tiger. The tiger was written in a, in a, in a fit of extreme schizophrenia, and he said people call him mad. Well, in a sense, he was mad, uh, but not by the McNaughton rules. William Blake, born 1757, died in 1827, the same year as Beethoven, that other stormy and revolutionary spirit. William Blake, poet, painter, 
and profit. Called mad in his own lifetime too by another poet, Wordsworth. But even Wordsworth said, there is something in the madness of this man which interests me more than the sanity of Lord Byron and Walter Scott. Blake was a mystic who painted an extraordinary world of his own imagining. stifled Blake with its decorum, humbug, and sense of order. It made a god of reason and let imagination die. The tiger, like all Blake's poems and pictures, takes life from his own private, luminous view of what is real. nearer the truth than most, or is he further away than most? Is man mad? Uh, is the man really saying something which goes very deep indeed? Blake's tiger, it's, it's, a, it's a great... <coughs> tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night. What immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry? In what distant deeps or skies burnt the fire of thine eyes? On what wings dare he aspire? what the hand there seize the fire. And what shoulder and what art could twist the sinews of thy heart? And when thy heart began to beat, what dread hand and what dread feet? What the hammer, what the chain, in what furnace was thy brain? What the anvil, what dread grasp dare its deadly terrors clasp? When the stars threw down their spears and watered heaven with their tears, did he smile his work to see? Did he who made the lamb make thee? Tiger, tiger, burning bright, bright in the forest of the, forest of the night. night. What immortal hand or eye dare frame thy fearful symmetry? I, I like this a lot, you know. Um, for the same reason I like that Yeats' second coming poem, because of this, this power and, and the seri the, these sort of fabulous images. I mean, just the straight tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forest of the night. I mean, it's banal, you've heard it so many times, but it's fine, you know. This, this is something you can keep thinking about and keep seeing doesn't progress too much for me. And it, especially the circle of bringing the first verse to the last seems to have rounded off right back to the beginning again. I don't want to go back to the beginning again. You know, it's an immediate poem. I think that's why he, he, he put the, the first verse at the end. It, it's an immediate experience. It's now. You're involved with it all the time. Well, why are you looking constantly? It's, it's the tiger for you. When did you first meet the tiger? Well, actually, I haven't seen it before today. You haven't? No. You don't know the tiger? No. Is it the sort of poem you would want to live with? Yes, it's strong. It's it's a hard-hitting poem. Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night. What immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry? What's the effect of, of that great kick at the start where he says, tiger, tiger, twice? And the, the obvious um, response is to say, well, it's an invocation to the tiger. If you look at it, I think that's just not true. The... A way of testing it is to put O Tiger at the front of it, as though uh, it were an invocation, O Tiger, Tiger. And you realise at once that he isn't saying O Tiger, Tiger. He isn't that pally with the tiger. He's saying Tiger, Tiger, as though he's standing in a position of almost awestruck wonder, and he's naming the name so as to begin to have some sort of grasp of it. But this is quite different from saying O Daffodils or O Tiger. And it's that kind of immediate, uh, trance-like almost, rapt quality of standing before it and knowing in an almost awestruck way that you are about to penetrate something you don't, you haven't really penetrated before that leads you into the poem. I think it's a good poem, but uh, it, it is a bit difficult to understand from first sight. Um, what parts of it don't you understand? Well, you... You have to understand what the poem is about.
first of all, when you look at it, you think, oh, it's just about the tiger, but when you look, read it again, you find that there's more than that. I don't think this poem is anything like any other poem, I don't think, really. Um, but I like it because of the description of the tiger and because, because it has a, que a one big question in it. What is that one big question? Well, did, did God make the tiger or didn't he? I see. And you think this is an important question? Yes, sir. I don't particularly like this poem. I've, I've read it a lot better. But I think uh, it would do for me. Uh, I don't like reading it. Uh, I don't like listening to it. But uh, I don't uh, particularly dislike it anyway. Can you say it why? It is a normal poem to me. Why, why well, you dislike it? It doesn't get through to me any meaning that uh, is strong enough that this question, did God make the tiger? Well, uh, I, sh I should think if he made anything, uh, he made the tiger. I can't see uh, whether it's got any importance. The creator took a chance when he made anything as fierce and damaging as the tiger can be. He took a great chance with us when he made human beings with instincts for power, for lust, for pride, for, uh, which have done a certain amount of damage in the world. Blake's point was that we, we have to bring all these instincts and of ours together and make a creative whole of them by using our imagination to try and understand what it's all about. So in this way, Blake was one of the great religious artists of the world. He was preaching a, a, a spiritual message, and that tiger is part of his spiritual message. Tiger, tiger, burning bright. Was the tiger burning? No, it's, a it's, it's a description of the tiger's coat because it was yellow and it resembled flame. It's a description of the coat. Yes, sir. The tiger wasn't on fire. No, sir. I see. What do you think, Roy? Uh, it said, tiger, tiger, burning bright in the, uh, in the dark night or something like that. In the well, forest. Well, if it's court, then it's a uh, dark night. It, it's, it can't be court because it won't be able to be uh, distinguished. Was it the tiger on fire, then? Uh, no, it, it must be some quality that's referred to as burning bright. What is that quality? Uh, it's the tiger's uh, overall... Uh, Sort of uh, way of life. In the poem, it's, uh, it strikes me as being uh, a very evil and terrible animal. But I find, on the contrary, I find them uh, often more placid and friendly. Burning suggests an enormous power and energy focused in one direction. It's a very strong word there. Very powerful. I mean, another way of, of testing it for strength is to substitute a word and say, Tiger, tiger, shining bright. And the poem's just dropped in the middle like some a pudding that's gone flat. The, the burning sort of colour and movement of it presents an, an incredible picture to me, you know, with the, the dark green of the forest and the burning orange of the tiger, and even the white of the lamb and the sparkling of the spears of the stars. Everything about it and the, the furnace and everything, just a terrific picture, never mind the meanings or the words or anything. Just even here at the first time, it had this tremendous picture, full of movement and colour, blazing out at me. I don't think it's terribly important to know exactly what a poem means, as long as it appeals. I don't mind what it means, or what the poet meant, or what it says, as long as the words personally appeal to me. I think this is the important thing with a poem. Why did the tiger strike home to you? Because it you can see such a clear picture of it, I think, from the first line. The jungle, the open grass, the prey, uh, the hunting for, for food. It's very striking, I think. Very exciting. But it's not just an animal poem, is it? I think so, yes. I think it's a remarkable beast. I mean, I empathy with that beast. I am, a, you know, that wild. Um, yes, I think it's a noble beast. I see the tiger as wholly terrible, magnificent and terrible, but I wonder if it is wholly bad. But, but in any case, most of us have got both the tiger and lamb in ourselves, haven't we? I'm not concerned with such minors as good and bad, which I don't think can be you know, that simply explained. What one has set up here is the sense of power and energy, making for order and control, and what is it ordering and controlling? What is it working towards? Well, uncreated chaos, mess, disorder, the forests of the night, I think are all those 
vast uncharted complexities, thick and impalpable, that we feel are around us, whether we're children waking up in the middle of the night, or adults realizing the uh, appalling confusions of human life. One of my um, colleagues who works with the uh, children uh, remarked that he thought this is the, the, the poem was very much like the sort of dream you'd expect a little boy to have on the, of about four, say, waking up in the middle of the night and finding his hand uh, over his erect penis. That there's uh, some, uh, it certainly lends itself to um, an experience of a confrontation of a ferocious and alien energy, which in our world, which it needn't be, is often found, first of all, in one's own body, in terms of one's sexual feeling. Nobody can be indifferent to that poem. Blake rewrote his poem many times, and his own manuscript shows the alterations and cuts he made. In one early draft, he called the tiger crow. This word crow, is the tiger crow in any real sense at all? Well, I mean, I've always felt the tiger not as a, a frightening beast. It's always appealed to me as something rather nice. And I think if the cruel had been in, it might have made a difference to my feeling about it. If he's going to use it as, an, as a proper symbol, he mustn't then try and condition it by using the word cruelty or anything. He doesn't want to suggest to you anything but what you yourself feel for any symbol he uses. Good point. And if he's going to start putting cruel, he's going to start putting kind, desperate, anything, and it's going to immediately lower that symbol, make it far more compact and, and less useful as a word. Right, this is a good point, a very good one. Um, so cruel goes. In what distant deeps or skies burnt the fire of thine eyes? Why do you think, in the second verse of the poem, Blake asks the question, in what distant deeps or skies? What have the deeps got to do with it, if it's all God's work? I think there, I'm, I'm not sure of the answer to this one, but I should have thought that he's still working within a, a, a symbolic framework where he thinks of heaven as up there and, and we're down here so that uh, it's in the depths of infinite space that he envisages the creative act being born. So deeps and skies uh, couldn't possibly, to your mind, be hell and heaven? I don't think so, no. Blake's wondering whether it's um, made by the devil or God. I think that's very good. I think Blake is wondering that in a way, yes. And what do you think his answer is? Do you think he decides who made it? I think he decides in the end that God made it. What makes you say that? Well, I assume he's a Christian. In the last line he says, who dares to frame the symmetry of the tiger? And, um, well, if he's a good Christian, could only be one person who would dare to. Do you go to church? No. I'm an atheist. What shoulder and what art could twist the sinews of thy heart? And when thy heart began to beat, what dread hand and what dread feet? And when thy heart began to beat, what dread hand and what dread feet? There's something odd about this verse, what is it? The inconclusive end is sort of what dread feet, well, I think is not The inconclusive ends. This is, of course, um, the same through to the last, to the last draft. In fact, it can make sense in a sort of way if you look at the possible solution in the first draft. What dread hand and what dread feet could fetch it from the furnace deep and in thy horrid ribs dare steep in the well of sanguine woe? In what clay and in what mould were thy eyes a fury rolled? All cut, and yet he leaves the question inconclusive. Now, is this a, is this a fault? Do you guess? Blake struck the lines out and didn't bother to improve the grammar, or what? No, well, it makes you, gives you, you room to imagine, doesn't it? I mean, you, it's much more powerful without the solution. I more mean, powerful? Uh, I mean, the dread, you know, it could be anything. You, yeah. is, it, is it really confused here, Mandy, um, the what dread hand and what dread feet? Whose dread hand? Whose dread feet? Well, it doesn't matter. It's just, you know, dread. If you put fearful in the first line, he has and dread in mean, the first verse, and dread in the third, and it's all a mystery, and, and you're not really supposed to know it's up to... People to feel for themselves what it is. He's not going to tell you. It's just dread. Is she, is but not she, a cruel dread, a sort of 
Uh, as um, Cathy said, awe inspiring. Awe inspiring. Are the dread hand and the dread feet necessarily the tiger's dread hand and dread feet, or necessarily the creator's dread hand and dread feet? In Not necessarily. Not necessarily either. Either. And the difficulty is it doesn't quite make sense. Uh, there's that uh, that verse. And what shoulder and what art could twist the sinews of thy heart? And when thy heart began to beat, what dread hand and what dread feet? Well, you think, uh, he's thinking of, of God as, as making the tiger. And where do the feet come in? Is he thinking of, of a, a potter who puddles clay with his feet? Or is he thinking of a smith who blows the bellows with his foot? But uh, it somehow leaves you in the air. and. Also, this mixture of, of tenses, uh, could, twist, and then dare, although it's in the present. And uh, I was puzzled about this, and so I naturally had the idea that I'd better go back to the original, which is the Rossetti manuscript. And I find that the feet have been left over from a, li from a verse which she suppressed. And it was like this, what red hand and what red feet could fetch it from the furnace deep, and in thy horrid ribs dare steep, in the well of sanguine woe, in what clay and in what mould have thy eyes of fury rolled? Well, now, that, he realised that was bad, because first of all you have uh, feet and beat, and then deep and steep, which are too closely rhymed together. And uh, uh, it's all the sanguine woe, he realises a bit of uh, eloquence, not poetry. And so he cut it out, and he left the word feet in the air. And uh, he didn't really care. And in a way, that's, that was honest of him, but it makes, uh, it makes rather a mess of the poem for the reader. Graves has made his own arrangement of the tiger, cutting out two verses and putting the whole poem in the past tense. Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night, what immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry? In what distant deeps or skies burnt the fire of thine eyes? On what wings dared he aspire? What the hand dared seize the fire? And what shoulder and what art could twist the sinews of thy heart? Did he smile his work to see? Did he who made the lamb make thee? Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night. What immortal hand or eye dared frame thy fearful symmetry? Well, what's he done for the poem? Ruined it. <laughs> Amanda, you see, he's ruined the poem. How can you have ruined well, the poem? Well, you don't want to, to rewrite a poem, of some, a poem of somebody else's who's a better poet anyway, I think, and, and tell us what we should read into it. And, you know, to cut out half the verses which Blake wanted to put in there, therefore should be there. And to sum it up for us, so that we can understand it, that he's so patronising it, because we can't, we're well, incapable of understanding Blake, and it's because he can't understand Blake, he assumes we can't. Well, the only verse that remains unchanged right the way through from the first draft to the last final version is the one which begins, and what shoulder, and what art. And he's cut out the last two lines of that verse, the ones which we were arguing about, what dread hand and what dread feet. And yet those are the, probably the only ones that Blake was really sure about. He's cut these out because he says the question and what dread hand and what dread feet is imprecise and ambiguous. He ties it in with the, 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 the stanza in Blake's first draft, which follows, could fetch it from the furnace deep, and says that Blake got into a muddle, crossed out his lines, and then left the thing grammatically incoherent at the end of it, and so the whole thing had better go. Would no one like to defend uh, Robert Graves on this? Well, on principle, yeah, I would, I would, you know, say he's got the right to do what he likes to the poem, really. I mean, as long as, on principle, but just in practice, it hasn't turned out in any way uh, as good a poem. Cutting up the, the present tense, it just takes all animation away from the poem at all. Because whereas with Blake, you're, you're in it, I mean, you can't help being involved. With great, with um, Grace's version, you're just sort of sitting back and look at, looking at it and saying, hmm, well, there's this tiger and this lamb and God and... You know, what are we going to do about it? I mean, the Blake's mystery means much more than... I mean, Gray's is just... It may work properly and it may all be grammatical, but it means so much less, doesn't it? I mean, it may... I mean, what's... Why should the sort of rationality of Gray's mean more than... I mean, I don't think Blake's muddled anyway. I mean, if he is, everything's muddled. I mean, the whole creation must have been quite muddled. And so I think, I think it's ridiculous, Gray's. I don't think you can, can try and rationalise it. I mean... 
Um, all right, we know about Blake as, as being a sort of anti, anti-rational, almost. And I'm not sure if he doesn't just mean this poem to, to appeal, just lower down than the just straight rationally. What's the hammer? What's the chain? In what furnace was thy brain? What's the anvil? What dread grasp dare its deadly terrors clasp? I learnt it as a child. Uh, it was taught to me in a very special way. Taught to me as if it were a poem about how God were able to create the world. You know, he'd made the flowers, and here he's making the tiger. That's because I went to a, a school which was really run like a sort of Methodist Sunday school. The whole school was run like that. Every poem had a little, was in fact a little poem about God's grace and power. So I learned it like that. Uh, I think it's clear that in my first learning of it, something else came through, because what I then thought was that it wasn't really about God's a- ability to create the world. It was a description of a tiger, and for a long time I actually thought of the poem quite differently from what it actually is. I actually thought it was a kind of picture of a tiger. Then I've read it again, and I've taught it, and every time I have to teach it in a different way, or read it in a different way, and I see something that I've not seen before. Uh, so, I, you know, I think that does mean that I don't quite understand it. I don't understand it all. <laughs> I definitely don't believe that it's a bad thing, uh, a tiger, and um, I think he's really trying to praise it. Does it tell us anything about the characteristics or the qualities of whoever made the tiger? Uh, yes, it uh, says that who dare have made such and such a thing of the tiger, of his body. What does this tell us about the person who made it? Well, he was uh, strong, stronger than the lion, in, fla- in fact. Stronger than the tiger? In the tiger. Yes. But I think the poet's trying to um, compare God to the tiger. The beauty of the tiger is trying to get, build up a picture of God, although he's talking about the tiger. Why should he do this? This is very interesting. Why should he do this? If he wants to write a poem about God, why didn't he write a poem about God? Why should he choose a tiger to do this? Because it? nobody's seen God. He's thinking, um, well, a tiger's beautiful, therefore God must be beautiful, because God made the tiger. So he's taking something... So he's describing this uh, tiger as, um, as if it was God. He means to show that God has many qualities that if he has created the Holy Lamb and he has created the tiger, therefore he's got both qu- both kinds of qualities and, and some more as well. It's not just the tiger qualities. Uh, I think I've changed my mind a bit. I think that the poem um, is not really statements. In fact, I think that this is really nearly all questions. Well, it is, in fact, yes. If you had seen the text, which you haven't, you would see that every single sentence is as a question. Why? Um... I don't know, I should say that he doesn't really know, uh, Blake doesn't really know all that much about the tiger. Uh, and he's trying to sort of find out, really. He's asking questions. Yes, sir. What's the effect of asking questions rather than making statements? Uh, well, it makes put a bit more mystery into the poem. The opening of the poem reminds me irresistibly of a, a picture by Douanier Rousseau, which I may get it slightly wrong, but as I remember it, what you have is an immense overgrown green forest which nearly chokes you. I think it's the forest of the night. And out of that, I think it's a lion, a very odd lion, as always in Rousseau, peering, and its eyeballs are boring through it. And I remember seeing that first when I was a child and knowing that's it. And one of our children felt the same way. And I didn't mean that's it, it's Blake. I mean, I know what that's about, even though I couldn't have said it. And whenever I hear tiger, tiger burning bright in the forest of the night, I want to pin it under that Douanier Rousseau. I'm sure it's uh, at the imaginative level that they're operating in, that they, they live in the same world. Tiger, tiger burning bright in the forest of the night. What immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry? In what distant deeps or skies burnt the fire of thine eyes. On what wings dare he aspire? What the hand dare seize the fire? And what shoulder and what art could twist the sinews of thy heart? And when thy heart began to beat, what dread hand and what dread feet? What the hammer, what the chain? In what furnace was thy brain? What the anvil, what dread grasp dare its deadly terrors clasp. When the stars threw down their spears and watered heaven with their tears, did he smile his work to see? Did he, who made the land, make thee? Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night, 
What immortal hand or eye dare frame thy fearful symmetry? Most children are taught the tiger at one time or another, in one way or another. The words strike home in spite of or because of their mystery. Is the tiger good or bad? God's creature or the devil's or neither? The poem is a challenge, a real test of the reader, a test of thought and feeling and his own attitude to life. One puzzle is why Blake drew such a placid tiger at the end of the poem, a toy tiger with a sheepish grin. I haven't a clue. I just haven't a clue. <laughs> is looking at you. And what do you like about that? Well, its coat is sort of burning with its eyes glaring at you. And why is that nice? I don't know, really. <laughs> but it is. Yes, I know it is. The fact is that, uh, that uh, for a very long time, the tiger has been the symbol of what is called the Dionysiac principle. That is, say, the that... Uh, that ecstatic way of thinking and feeling, which is incorporated in the legend of Dionysus, who went to India and brought back tigers. And uh, the tiger is, which, which Blake very right, rightly uh, contrasts with the lamb, is the indomitable urge of the human spirit to be and do. Well, I think the poem is, um, it's very easy to imagine it, and then um, you can imagine the tiger with all its muscles and, and its padding and glossy and run, and its muscles running along its back and its bared teeth and um, brightly shining eyes, and I can imagine me just running away. And um, I think it's beautiful, the tiger, in a, in a kind of fierce kind of way, and I just don't think I could look at it without, you know, some kind of fear shuddering down my spine. He, he seems extra fierce than other tigers. Um, but he doesn't say anything in the poem about killing me anything. But he just looks fierce. He sounds fierce in the poem. Do you think it's a good poem? Yes, very good. I like the wider river moves. Very pleasant rhythm. Does it remind you of anything, the way the rhythm goes? Any other poem you've ever heard? No, but I don't read many poems. What about Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star? How I wonder what you are. Yes, it is like that, isn't it? Different sort of poem completely, don't you? When the stars threw down their spears and watered heaven with their tears, did he smile his work to see? Did he who made the lamb make thee? The Tigers, one of the few poems by Blake that still survives in his notebook. That fifth verse began like this. No punctuation. The words Blake crossed out are set here in italics, and his alternatives in the manuscript are set below each other. Blake finally put back some cancelled words and adopted the line order that he wrote on the left-hand side of the verse numbered five by him. 
in his notebook. First line to be third, second to be fourth, third line first, fourth and last line, and watered heaven with their tears, to be second. There may be a fine frenzy in the finished poem, but he revised the drafts very carefully indeed. When the stars threw down their spheres and watered heaven with their tears, did he smile his work to see? Did he who made the lamb make thee? What does one ask of this verse? It's quite straightforward that um, he made this tiger who's so incredibly terrible and he's sort of surrounded in blazing light and that even the stars who were pretty sort of untouchable, even they were horrified and threw down their spears and cried and everything. And then he, he just wondered, you know, could he have made, or one wonders in fact, Baker's asking you, could God have made this fantastic creature as well as making the, the ordinary little lamb? You know, there's such a contrast. Is that right from the stars? Um, well, truly this is a sort of a day of judgment image, a reconciliation image, you know, more than, more than a... a an image of the stars being horrified by what they see. I mean, I, the only way I could see it was, was the stars watering heaven, was, was a, a kind of melting together into a kind of great luminous, you know, day of judgment, clouds of glory sort of thing. Uh, the, the sky sort of brightening up with the, with, the, with the stars all melting together like tears. When the stars threw down their spears and watered heaven with their tears, did he smile his work to see? I think there's a contrast between the tiger and the lamb, but I don't think it's a contrast between good and evil, a contrast between something innocent and something experienced in the ways of the world, yes. But much more, the tiger seems to me to, uh, uh, to be a beast that has a kind of life of its own, separate from the divine, separate from God in that sense, almost a, a human physical animal, an existence that has its being in that world rather than in the divine world. And I think the poem is about... In this uh, video, I'm going to be talking about the Scots language. ...a being in, I mean, with a, with a sort of sphere of existence of its own, which is not necessarily evil, but physical and hard and uh, contained within itself, with its own sort of dynamic, its own laws, obeying its own laws. Nature, I should have thought, more than evil. You don't think that Blake intended the tiger to stand for evil in the poem? I never really thought of it that way, but I don't think so. A little further on, I don't remember the poem awfully well, but did he say, he who made the lamb made thee, or could he who made the lamb made thee? I think they're both God's creatures, and I think Blake would have made a more satanic origin to the tiger if he meant it to be evil. What is it most of all that draws you to Blake? Well, my great-grandfather, as a young man, was a pupil of Blake's, who was actually with him when he died, and so from quite early childhood we had rather a special interest in him. Some people have said that Blake was mad, or at least partly mad. What no, do you think? I don't think so. He was a visionary. I know that uh, my great-grandfather had known he'd gone for a walk and he'd come back. He asked him, what did he see? And he said, I saw angels in a tree. I don't think he was mad. He was gifted with a vision that perhaps we haven't got. When people start talking about Blake as a visionary, well, this is true. But, but I think that everyone sees visions and that, you know, usually people separate the visionary from the rest of humanity. And if he was separated in that way, I wouldn't be very interested in Blake. Um, but I think that everyone sees visions. Um, children see them most strongly, but usually they're just told, well, you're daydreaming. And daydreaming is a very inferior activity, which isn't encouraged. Um, some artists, Blake included, think that their daydreams are very important, and they work at their daydreams, and they use their daydreams. Um, most people lose the ability to daydream, um, except in a very small kind of way. They don't develop it to the hi incredible heights that Blake took it to, where he could daydream whole systems and galaxies. Um, 
people feel that there's a need for this, which is partly why people are attracted to Blake. It's partly why people are attracted to drugs, because then they can have daydreams um, and take them seriously, because the drug imparts some kind of spurious authority to the dream. But you don't think that the authority that Blake gives is spurious in that drug-taking way at all? No, because I think uh, he was in control of his dreams, of his daydreams, or visions, whichever you like. When the stars threw down their spears and watered heaven with their tears, did he smile his work to see? Did he who made the lamb make thee? If you think it through rationally and attach a meaning to it, are you necessarily going to be any more the truth than if you simply respond to the image without in fact analyzing it? But surely if we all respond totally differently, it's, it's a, I mean, if, if we see the stars horrified by this, and if we, or if we see the stars uh, as a sort of reconciled at the end. Surely, if the image has invoked so many responses, he might just well not have, not have written it down if he's trying to communicate something. Blake was a puzzle to his contemporaries, and he remains a mystery today. He thought of himself as a Christian, but the only time he went to church was to be married here in Battersea to the daughter of a market gardener. At that time, she could neither read nor write. And in the register, she signed with a cross. He had a marvellous wife, Catherine. One of her great remarks was when she, she first saw him, she decided to marry him, and she said, Young man, I pity thee. Blake was always isolated from conventional religion, belief, and comfort. His tiger is a visionary beast, made not by God, but Satan, compounded of both good and evil, and seen by Blake in its essential nature, according to the poet and authority on his work, Kathleen Rain. On several occasions, I have had the kind of experience I imagine Blake to have had continuously, and I'm bound to say the experience was quite overwhelming and unforgettable after 20 or 30 years. What happened? I was sitting one evening at a table uh, with a hyacinth in a glass in front of me. I was writing, not thinking of anything in particular, when suddenly the plant was transformed before my eyes. It was an instantaneous change of perception. And what had formerly seemed merely an object, I perceived as a living being. One could see, experience the life, the nature, the, the very essence and being of this, of this plant. It was extremely simple, but if one were to see the world continuously in its full being, I imagine it would always be so, and this would be a different kind of consciousness which would transform, literally, the kind of world that we live in. And that was Blake's world? I think that was Blake's world continuously, and this is why his second creator, his, his, his Satan, his Demiurge, is so often with him identified with the rational faculty which constricts and limits our mode of perceiving and experiencing the world. So finally, in fact, Blake would have to reject his tiger. That is... Made the... by Satan, made by the Demiurge. There again, the tiger, I think, contains the germs of so many future ideas. He would certainly uh, reject the tiger insofar as the tiger is the selfhood. But insofar as the tiger is a portion of energy which is eternal delight, I don't think he would ever reject his tiger. I think he saw the essence of the uh, being of the tiger in the way I've tried to describe seeing 
uh, a plant in its in its full being and whether the, the creature be a tiger a stone a plant or say perhaps it happens most often when we are in love we we see someone transform before our eyes this is an experience we can never reject because that is uh, the fullest possible uh, consciousness of reality of which we are capable and it's what it's all about it's what it's all about yes and that is what poetry insofar as it is as i believe it to be the language of the imagination is or ought to be all about after the poem met at you a lot and uh, difficult to tell why that's so it matters because it's got so much force and the force i think comes from the fact that it's it's so hard its images are so hard they're gem like they're they're like rock almost and uh, i think the power of the poem comes from the fact that although its surface and its images and so on are so firm yet they reverberate out they sort of capture you know themes and meanings which are much more indefinite much more indistinct but you can never move away to the themes the poem doesn't point don't no, the poem doesn't point away from itself it always keeps coming back to its own very precise questions its own very hard surface and that's what gives it a kind of completeness in my mind almost like a like a stone like a rock like a jewel does the poem for you have a happy ending no it has an ambiguous ending an, an ending which is also in some ways terrifying and that's i think because of how i think of the poem moving it seems to move uh, from a point where god or whoever is the creator of the tiger has control over it and as the poem goes on the tiger gains gains a life of its own i think it always had uh, i noticed the way in which uh, you're never <clears throat> you're never quite sure whether it's god who makes the heart start to beat it's almost as if he gets the elements together but suddenly the heart starts to beat on its own account as the poem goes on the tiger seems to escape his control so the frankenstein touch yes yes it's it's something which he, he 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 has a sense of wanting to make and he knows how to draw them together but the more he beats the more quite different thing comes into life and at the end there it is much more terrible much more other than he'd imagined it to be and he's a little bit terrified of it uh, now that's not a happy or sad ending but it does give a sense of uh, well almost as if you watch this beast come alive in the poem through the poem and watch god move from a point where he can control it to the point where he has to recognize it and salute it at the end something separate from him tiger tiger burning bright in the forests of the night what immortal hand or eye could frame that fearful symmetry in what distant deeps or skies burnt the fire of thine eyes on what wings dare he aspire what the hand dare seize the fire and what shoulder and what art could twist the sinews of thy heart and when thy heart began to beat what dread hand and what dread feet what the hammer what the chain in what furnace was thy brain what the anvil what dread grasp dare its deadly terrors clasp when the stars threw down their spears and watered heaven with their tears did he smile his work to see did he who made the lamb make thee tiger tiger burning bright in the forests of the night what immortal hand or eye
Mrs. Delia I presume? Mr. Fenby. Entranced by the music of Frederick Delius, a young organist goes to France to aid the blind and paralyzed composer. It is the dream of my life that he will be able to compose again. It was along this road, Fenway, that I contemplated all my finest works. Ken Russell's celebrated film Song of Summer continues the season of omnibus classics to celebrate the program's 25th year, next Tuesday at 10.25 on BBC One. Washington celebrates change as Bill Clinton goes to the White House, the first Democrat since Jimmy Carter in the late 70s. He'll be sworn in here at the Capitol and then make his first major speech as president, setting the tone as he takes on a tough job in tough times. Join us live from Washington for the inauguration of the president tomorrow afternoon at 4.30 on BBC Two. And on BBC Two Now, the Late Show American Special looks at how the election campaign that brought Bill Clinton to power has changed the way politicians in America now deal with the media. And in a change of programme tomorrow evening here on BBC One, there's a chance to see an historic event which took place last weekend on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial in New York, when dozens of top stars from the entertainment world join in a special gala performance. An American reunion, the People's Inaugural Celebration, tomorrow night at 11.45. Now tonight's movie classic. Bert Lancaster stars as a vicious gossip writer who takes pleasure in destroying lives, and Tony 